Hi, I'm James Michael Riley, and welcome to Worse, stories of strength and endurance from the old days. Times are tough, but we'll get through this. We've been through worse. All right, tonight, as we talk here by the fire, I'm apparently having a Virginia day here uh, at Worse. I'm drinking Bull Rock Hard Cider. Uh, this is a uh, product grown from made from apples grown in Virginia and North Carolina, and it's brewed in Virginia. Uh, I'm also eating um, margarita brand pepperoni, which I assume is probably made in New York or New Jersey somewhere. This uh, company is also based in Virginia. So, <laughs> welcome. All right. If you want to get something to eat or drink, maybe you can stop this, grab it, and come on, sit down with me up by the fire. We'll get started. So, apparently, the mountains of North Korea are beautiful if you can stand the statues of the current dictator or his father or his father who have handed power down like a line of kings in a place that calls itself a democratic republic. But nevertheless, there are possibilities for mountain biking, for hiking, but one thing is for sure, and this comes to us from Oliver P. Smith, the commanding general of the 1st Marine Division. The mountains of North Korea were never intended for military operations. So after World War II, Korea, which had been part of the Japanese Empire, was divvied up by the U.S. and the Soviets, <clears throat> divided into two separate nations along the 38th parallel, which is a degree of latitude. Uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, borders Korea along a tiny strip, but most of North Korea's land boundary is with China. Well, a few years after World War II, mainland China went communist. So uh, the Korean War started in June of 1950, when the Communist North attacked the then right-wing dictatorship um, South. And the following month, the U.S., that didn't want another country to fall to communism, uh, intervened in the conflict uh, under the auspices of the United Nations. Their defensive efforts in support of the South Korean military didn't go well until the U.S. and the United Nations went on the offensive to not only protect South Korea, but to liberate North Korea from the communists. So in September and October of 1950, there were amphibious operations along the two coasts of Korea. On the west coast at Incheon, uh, the Marines landed, and on the east coast at Wonsan. So amphibious operations in U.S. military history always mean the Marines, and in this case it was the 1st Marine Division, part of the U.S. 10th Corps. Well, the Chinese didn't want North Korea to stop being communist, so they attacked our forces over their border with North Korea uh, in October of 1950. Uh, over 20 Chinese divisions attacked. They greatly outnumbered us. Um, the Marines, Marines were directed to advance in the direction of the enemy to a place called the Chosin Reservoir. In Korea, in Korean, it's called the Changjin Reservoir, but uh, Chosin is closer to what the Japanese had called it when they ran the place, and so the name stuck. Uh, this was a, a late fall and early winter uh, in the mountains of North Korea that was extraordinarily cold. The only way that our forces who made their way to the southern tip of the reservoir and then uh, advanced along both sides, establishing camps as they went, the only way that they could make defensive positions like digging foxholes was with explosives and bulldozers. That's how hard the ground was. Uh, nevertheless, um, they established these positions, and this is, in, in my humble opinion, um, an example of the times in military history when a water obstacle has split a force, making it more easy for um, an enemy to attack them successfully. And the, the uh, American forces, uh, Marine First Division, spread out along the southern side of the, of the reservoir, and uh, Task Force McLean, which I believe was an army um, force uh, spread out along the northern side, uh, were not in a position of being able to reinforce each other because the reservoir separated them. Uh, the Chinese attacked them on both sides. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the Chinese force numbered 150,000 soldiers. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps website says it was 120,000 Chinese soldiers. Uh, the number of combined U.S., South Korean, and British soldiers in the engagement were approximately 30,000. So they were outnumbered four or five to one. 
So they were up against considerable odds. But at least as big an obstacle was the temperatures and the weather. Uh, it's said in the U.S. Marine Corps website that even men with minor wounds or injuries frequently died. If you stopped moving, you froze. One of the advantages that the Marines had in this fight was that they had artillery the Chinese didn't have. And one of the reasons the Chinese didn't bring artillery to the fight was that anything in this would have been brought along narrow mountain roads and passes. And the Chinese had no uh, air force to speak of. But the United States had air powers they could bring to bear every day during daylight hours. And so uh, artillery moving along the narrow, uh, very, very small number of roads would have been extremely vulnerable to our air power. So that's one advantage we had that it was able to uh, equalize the fight a little more. Generally speaking, our forces were more technologically advanced than the Chinese were. So despite the fact that they were greatly outnumbered, the, um, the Marines along the southern side of the reservoir were able to hold their own. Uh, despite experiencing losses, the Chinese experienced far more losses. And one Marine described it as you would uh, kill one Chinese soldier and 10 or 12 would take his place. Along the northern side of the reservoir, Task Force McLean was effectively defeated by the Chinese. Half of their soldiers were um, wounded or killed or captured, and the other half retreated, some of them directly across the frozen lake bed to the southern end where the, um, the U.S. and U.N. forces had, their, had established a stronghold. So uh, it was clear that what the Chinese wanted to do was to annihilate the American force. Um, and that was something that was a risk because although we were uh, uh, killing more of the enemy than they were of us, uh, we had far fewer to begin with. So uh, Commander Smith that I mentioned earlier um, said, uh, gave the instruction to, as he put it, advance in a different direction. And what that meant was to withdraw his forces in a fighting retreat 70 or 80 miles through mountain passes during this brutally cold season uh, to the seacoast on the western side of Korea where they could be uh, evacuated by sea. So the Marines retreated along the roads, um, some along the roads to protect the artillery and equipment. Others struggled through the mountains themselves on either side of the roads to break up the Chinese positions, what they call the fire pots that were lying in wait for them. Now, it had been uh, suggested to Commander Smith that he could get all of the men out most easily uh, by evacuating them by air, but he rejected this idea because this would have meant uh, two things. One, it would have meant leaving behind their artillery and equipment. Um, and the other thing was that while this force was retreating uh, in the more northern part of this conflict, uh, on the east coast where forces had landed in Incheon, those forces were also retreating. And the fact that the Chinese had two different enemies to fight for an extended period of time made it easier for more of those forces on the, um, I'm sorry, on the western coast near Incheon to uh, retreat effectively and to regroup. So um, the um, Marines and the other parts of the 10th Corps arrived at a town called Hagaru-ri on December 4th. This was about five or six days after they began their retreat, where they were able to fly out some casualties and to get more fuel for their trucks. And then two days later, on December 6th, they continued the last 18 miles of their journey to the coast, still through the mountains. And this was possibly the worst part. Uh, the Chinese had uh, destroyed a bridge, but uh, parts of a bridge were airdropped to them, and enough of those pieces survived that they were able to build enough of a bridge to get their trucks across and to continue their fighting retreat. Uh, in another position, uh, the Chinese were lying in wait for them in a pass, but the Marines cleared those Chinese out in a night action when the temperatures got to 30 below zero. They finally got to the coast to a town of Hongnam, uh, the Chinese had tried to take it before the Marines arrived on December 3rd, but the 1st Infantry Division uh, fought them off. Uh, the last of the Marines, the rear guard, was loaded onto the waiting transport ships on December 15th when the Chinese made uh, one more attempt, which was also rebuffed, to uh, attack them at the seaport of Hongnam. And as the Marine uh, website puts it, resistance by the Chinese had become almost token at that point, their troops ruined by cold, starvation, and relentless 10 Corps firepower. The Chinese were vague on their losses. <clears throat> uh, the best estimates on, um, from historians on our side are that uh, they had 40 to 80,000 casualties. Uh, the 1st Marine Division had under 12,000 casualties. And in each case, 
that is uh, people, casualties are always wounded and killed uh, numbers combined, and that these were both from the enemy engagement and from the cold. And in fact, the Marines lost more soldiers to the cold than they did to the enemy. That may have been true of the Chinese as well. But those surviving men and the equipment that, that Commander Smith refused to leave behind helped to protect South Korea as the war continued. And they had also demonstrated by their fighting retreat against when vastly outnumbered that we could defeat a greater Chinese numbers. Now, in the modern era, the population of South Korea is about 51 million. In the time of the Korean War, it was a, I guess what you would say, a right-wing dictatorship. But since then, it has reformed itself and joined the ranks of democracies. Those 51 million people now live in a democracy. Uh, North Korea, despite having a, um, I believe, a larger landmass than South Korea, uh, has a population a third to a half as large. And South Korea's gross domestic product is 54 times greater than that of North Korea. There are 51 million people in South Korea today that in part owe their freedom and their prosperity to men like the Marines of the 1st Division. My dad told me about the sacrifices that they made. He was in Korea, but he didn't see combat. He was a Marine. He passed away about two months ago. And he told me that someone who had fought at Chosen told him that it was so cold that they literally could not get their fingers to work to fire their machine guns. They had to reach through with the other hand and grab their hand and push their hand onto the trigger to get it to fire the gun. My dad got choked up as he told me the story of their sacrifice. So I want to thank History.com, Britannica.com, U.S. Mill, USMC.mil, Statista.com, and uh, for for their contributions to the story. All right, now we're going to go from cold to heat. Blood Diamond is a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Demon Honchu, and Jennifer Connelly that came out in 2006. It was about the uh, civil war in Sierra Leone, a country in Africa. This war went on during the 90s and into 2002, in which diamond mining, conducted under slave labor conditions, was used by re the rebels and possibly by the government as well to finance the war. There are many countries in Africa that produce some diamonds. Uh, historically, South Africa had been the big player, in which yields have declined um, in recent years. So for much of human history, diamonds came from India. And then for a long time after uh, European countries colonized the Western Hemisphere, Brazil was a major source. But in 1867, the son of a uh, poor farmer in South Africa discovered a shiny stone. Um, it went through several hands. Somebody discovered that it would scratch glass. Then somebody else uh, sated a little more carefully than somebody else. And eventually they discovered that what they had on their hands was an enormous diamond. So miners flocked to the area, and within a few years, South Africa produced more diamonds than India had produced in 2,000 years. It was an absolute bonanza, perhaps in a literal sense, uh, a gold rush, but a diamond rush um, that... Uh, Found that discovered an enormous number of diamonds that then went on to the world markets, helping to make diamonds available to the middle class, whereas before they'd only been something for royalty. Um, so, because other people started to look for these as they put them blink pipa, or bright stones. That's in the, um, uh, the Dutch or Afrikaans uh, language that is spoken by some people in South Africa. In fact, I wonder if that word blink, which means bright, could be the source of our term bling. That's just speculation on my part. I don't know. So the diamond region in Africa is in a tectonic cold spot in the Earth's crust. Uh, the deeper you go in the Earth, the hotter it gets. But it doesn't get as hot as fast there as it does in a lot of other places on Earth. Very strange. Um, so mines as deep as those in South Africa, and six of the ten deepest mines on Earth are in South Africa, would be at the boiling temperature of water, but their temperatures are actually much lower. Um, still, mechanical cooling is necessary. But if that makes you think of it in an air-conditioned environment, think again. There is a uh, researcher at uh, the University of New Mexico named Suzanne Schneider. She did a paper in 2016 called Heat Acclimation, 
gold mines and genes. Wow. And she looked at South Africa, even though she works in the Department of Exercise Sciences at the University of New Mexico. Um, the, the historical view had been that people of African descent were more heat resistant than white people. But uh, Ms. Schneider's research indicated that something else is going on. She said, um, we now have our current appreciation of the epigenetic and other molecular adaptations that occur with exposure to heat. In other, in other words, everyone has to get used to intensely hot environments, and many, many people can. Some can, some can't, and it's not necessarily associated with any racial or ethnic group. <clears throat> so uh, the South African mines, over the course of their, of their uh, history, which, I said, as I mentioned, goes back into the mid-1800s, um, has been a race between the acclimation protocols created by the mine owners, that is, the means by which you get your workers used to working in intensely hot environments, and increases in depth. So the acclimation protocols would work, then they dig in deeper and they wouldn't work. Then they come up with mechanical air conditioning, and things would get better for a while. Then they dig even deeper, and then those that wouldn't work anymore. And changes, have, they've continually had to make them. Um, but, do, but one thing is for certain is that they are intensely hot working environments, um, like, like 120 degrees. And water spray is used all the time to keep the dust down, which means that the humidity is constantly around 100%. So acclimation at one point meant that a new worker would spend uh, half their time shoveling at a reduced depth so their body could get used to doing hard manual labor in intensely hot conditions. <clears throat> and then as they got more and more used to it, they would be worked for longer periods of time at lower and lower depths. In the 1980s, they came up with microclimate cooling. And this, more than anything else, underlined for me how doggone hot this was. Microclimate cooling is that approximately a third of the miner's body surface is covered in a dry ice-containing vest, which allows them to work at, uh, full, at a full, uh, full work day at a deep level while preventing an excessive rise in body temperature. Good Lord in heaven. So from 1984 to 2005, uh, 11,000 mine workers died in South Africa. In 2005, an initiative was begun to cut the deaths, and they did go down quite significantly. But I, I have to give credit to the, uh, the DMR, the Department of uh, Mineral Resources and Environment of the Government of South Africa. Um, their website offers not only statistics, but chilling details that do not necessarily paint a pretty picture of this thing, which is such a mainstay of the South African economy. Um, on this website, the last stats were 2018. I don't know why that is. If you know, reach out to me. Um, but they, they include on this website a pie chart. Now, we've all seen pie charts. You know, here are the, here's the income from something, here's the expenses, and it's all cut out like, you know, bigger, small pieces of a pie. This pie chart was a breakdown of the causes of fatalities in South African mines. The biggest piece of the pie by far, 37%, was what they call fall of ground, which is basically means uh, a collapse uh, where, where there's a cave, what we might call a cave-in. Uh, some of these were caused by the fact that they were moving the earth around to dig deeper, and some of them would be caused by seismic shifts. There'd be a little bit of a tremor, and then a whole bunch of the, of the ceiling would cave in. Um, but the other categories are a testament to me of the conditions that people worldwide have had have endured to bring us the things that we want and need in our lives. Some of the deaths uh, uh, reflected on this pie chart were gas, dust, and fumes, struck by rolling rock, inundated with ore, mud rush, and the most chilling to me, general caught between. Uh, another location uh, described how the, the large carts that run on rails and are used to carry the ore out of the ground often have very low clearance as they go through doors and as they go through uh, lower parts of the tunnels. So dying from general caught between paints a visual image that is truly chilling to contemplate. Yesterday I was annoyed because um, I was trying to work and I could hear the music my wife was playing. I think I need to get a life. So <clears throat> these statistics, for the most part, reflect the ordinary year-to-year -year operations of the mines. These are the people that die as the mine engages in its normal operations. But to their credit, 
the DMR has a whole separate tab for disaster type accidents. Hundreds of people, for example, killed in 1960 when the disintegration of the underground pillars supporting the tunnel roof uh, caused a widespread collapse. The bodies of the mine workers that were killed in this accident were never recovered. In 1986, 177 mine workers were killed when an acetylene cylinder ignited the polyurethane foam that covered the sidewalls of the mining tunnel. Very few statistics before the early 1900s. I strongly doubt that means that there were fewer fatalities then. So all of this we've, I've described so far is, is industrial mining. That's the best kind. That's the more, most humane kind. Then there's the kind that was described in the movie Blood Diamonds, conflict diamond mining, um, where, which is conducted under slave labor conditions and um, where people are often killed, raped, massacred by the people that are forcing them to do this. Uh, it was especially bad in Sierra Leone and in, in Angola in the years around the year 2000. There was a process in 2003 ratified uh, by many nations called the Kimberley Process. Kimberley is a region of South Africa that's historically been a big mining region. Um, and that's where this meeting was held uh, that came up with this process to verify the source of a diamond. So it, it's, it's riddled with loopholes but it has brought about a reduction in the saleability of diamonds that are uh, produced under conditions of slave labor and what they call conflict diamonds. So, and then somewhere in between industrial mining and conflict diamonds are what is euphemistically, euphemistically called artisanal diamond, diamond mining. So these are, um, these are diamonds mined by small groups of individuals digging by hand. It's mostly boys and young men. Uh, they are digging and sifting, often indebted to the people who provide the plot of land or the equipment. And there are people who have been forced to choose between doing this awful backbreaking work and going to school because they want to feed themselves and their families. Uh, they often go for long periods without finding anything. All those uh, days or weeks of sifting through dirt while their debts pile up with uh, nothing to show for it. So the problem with this Kimberly process is that it, it only covers um, diamonds mine to fund rebels. It doesn't cover unfair labor practices. But there are signs of uh, progress, even in the, artisan, the artisanal diamond producing places. Uh, Botswana and Namibia are two countries that have done a better job than most at enforcing labor and safety laws. And there's a company called Brilliant Earth that's offering financial support, specifically so kids that are at risk of going into mining can go to school instead. So if you buy a diamond, and I, I think I may never have actually, you can make choices now that will make it more likely that the strength and hard work of some of the poorest people in the world is being rewarded. So I want to thank the Gemological Institute of America, South Africa's Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, and Time Magazine for information going into this story. <clears throat> Precious rabies. I know of someone who got bitten by a woodchuck while she was walking from her car to her house about 10 years ago. Uh, there was a friend nearby who killed the woodchuck with a rake. Uh, they called the town to report the incident. They were put in touch with the state and somebody drove up from the state um, capital to get the body of this woodchuck so it could be tested for rabies. But before that, uh, the results of that test were even in, uh, my friend who had been bitten had already been given rabies shots. Now, we've heard of probably, if you have, I have heard of rabies shots, and I'd always heard that they were this awful thing that went into the stomach cavity. Um, but the protocol now is that someone who's been bitten by an animal suspected to have rabies is four shots given in the arm or, in a, or for kids in the leg, plus a shot of rabies immune globulin. So there are also people who can get the vaccine before they're even exposed when there isn't when they're not believed to have been bitten by a, rab a rabbit animal because they're in high risk groups like veterinarians and here's another interesting one spelunkers people who climb around and explore caves because bats are one of the species that most commonly transmits rabies to human beings so in learning about the the case of this young woman named precious reynolds who lived in, uh, lives in California, um, was that once rabies infects you, it's 99.9% .9 fatal. According to WebMD, 
Rabies has the highest mortality rate of any disease on earth. <laughs> what? How did, I, how did I not learn this all these years? So in the case of Precious Reynolds, she was scratched by a feral cat, possibly bitten as well in a small way on the finger. Uh, they're not sure. Um, she started to get sick, and the docs, doctors didn't even consider rabies until it was fairly far advanced. Um, the virus, what it does, this awful rabies virus, is it works its way into the brain and the spine, and it causes encephalitis. So uh, Precious was put in a medically induced coma, and then she was given antiviral medications. This uh, way of responding to rabies is what's called the Milwaukee Protocol. It was used to save a kid in Wisconsin in 2004. Um, the thing with the Milwaukee Protocol, the creator of it says that natural resistance may be at play, may be in play when it comes to somebody surviving rabies. And he can't even say with 100% certain that there's any value added benefit to engaging in the Milwaukee Protocol because so few people who have been actually infected with rabies have ever survived. Uh, this uh, Precious Reynolds was given the Milwaukee Protocol. She survived. Someone in Wisconsin was given to it a few years earlier. And then the only other instance of someone getting rabies and living that I found was in 2009 in Texas. And that person just happened to survive without going into intensive care at all. Very strange. Uh, there's a magazine uh, called SFGate. It's online, sfgate.com. I'd always known it as a uh, source of information on interior design and home uh, building and things like that. But apparently the SF just stands for San Francisco, and it's just a newsletter for people who live in San Francisco. And this woman, Precious Girl, Precious Reynolds, lived near there. So SF Gate had some insights too. She said it just could be that Precious's body was particularly adept at fighting off rabies. So she got a less, or maybe she got a less virulent strain. So I'm not 100% sure what the takeaway is from these strange stories, but um, <laughs> what underlines the seriousness of this disease is a doctor from the Children's Hospital of Oakland said, Precious's case shows that it is, quote, not necessarily futile to treat rabies. Boy, how's that for an endorsement that gives you a lot of confidence, huh? I was, uh, I was out cutting the grass once at dusk, and um, I looked up, and trotting out of the woods came a possum. You know, usually creatures that you usually only see dead in the road because they're so shy, and they stay away from people so much you don't see them. But here comes this possum trotting toward me. Uh, I knew this was extremely odd behavior, especially since I was running a loud lawnmower at the time. So I ran. I ran pretty far away to the far side of the yard, and I watched it. It came to a stop. It just stood there kind of looking confused for a minute, and then it slowly walked back into the woods. You can bet that I kept an eye on the, the edge of the woods for the rest of the time I was cutting the lawn that night. Another time, um, a raccoon in the middle of the day, raccoons not being a big fan of daylight, a raccoon in the middle of the day came out of a rock pile making odd noises and began to approach me. So I got in my car and uh, with the windows rolled up and I watched until it went away. I did not know at the time that I was probably this close to a disease that's 99.9% .9 fatal. So if there's any takeaway, it's get your animals vaccinated. Uh, dog and cat vaccinations are way cheaper than human vaccinations. About 50,000 people a year worldwide die of rabies and most of those deaths are caused by rabies transmitted by cats and dogs. So you can do the world a lot of good by getting your rabies shots for your, uh, for your pets. And uh, I'm also very glad that none of us probably will ever have to spend a week in a medically induced coma with a tube down our throat. So way to go, Precious. Glad you made it. And uh, long may you thrive. I want to thank the CDC, CBSNews.com, ABCNews.com, WebMD, and SFGate for information for this story. Thanks for joining us, folks, by the fire here for worse. Times are tough, but we'll get through this. We've been through worse. Good night.